Hi there, I'm the underscore twig, and I like analysing game rules. So a while ago, my friend SK asked me a question in a Discord we frequent. What is the most damage a D&D 5e character can do without using any resources? I don't think he was really expecting much more than some general discussions about how fighters and rogues are probably the best under these conditions. But he was asking me, and it was a Friday. The next 72 hours were spent single-mindedly theorycrafting to solve that question. This is the story of how we built the greatest resourceless character to ever exist in Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition. Probably. I've not seen anyone come close to these numbers, but that doesn't mean that they haven't, I guess. One of the easiest ways to make your character more powerful is to join my Patreon. These guys did, and now people bow before them when they walk by. Genuinely though, super big thanks to SK. He's the entire reason this video exists. So the first thing we needed to do was make some rules so we knew what was and wasn't a resource, and what the conditions of the battle were. For a 5 second rundown, huge 20 AC monster, it always runs towards you and attacks. Also, some of you might be thinking that a resourceless character doesn't exist because HP is a resource. My answer to that is, shut up and let me have fun. You can now skip to whatever timestamp I just put on screen, or you can listen to a more detailed set of rules. Right, rules. First up, anything which uses any kind of point, slot, or anything else that you regain after a short or long rest, or can only be done a limited number of times, is a resource. That includes spell slots, battlemaster manoeuvres, goblins fear of the small, the lucky feet, and the contingency spell. Second rule, any consumed items are also resources. That includes things like potions, poisons, and spell components. However, we made a specific exemption for ammunition, because otherwise all ranged weapons would become unviable, and that's no fun. Third, anything that you did at least two days ago is exempt. This prevents you from using something like animate dead spam on the day before, but allows you to use permanent things like find familiar. Exceptions for simulacrum and planar binding. We banned sim because it's a boring option, and said only one planar binding. Fourth, the enemy is a huge creature with 20 AC, plus 6 in all saves, and no resistances or immunities. On their turn, they will always approach you to within 5 feet, using the shortest path possible, and will use the attack action to make a melee attack against you. This was just to make sure that we all knew exactly what we were fighting. Fifth, the battlefield is perfectly flat, infinite, and it is a bright but overcast day. You have also never been here before. As far as we could tell, this gives no inherent advantages or disadvantages to any races. It also prevents spells like Hallow from working. Sixth, you have no other allies and no magic items, unless you made them yourself with a class feature or spells. However, Renaissance guns are allowed. And finally, it is the sixth turn of combat. This rule was just to prevent features which only work on turn one, such as Gloomstalker's Dread Ambusher, from working. It also allows more than enough time for any setup that you might need to do. Also probably worth noting is that at the time we sort of had this thing about free feet backgrounds, so we ended up banning them. I think that the best thing you could get from any of them is Magic Initiate for Find Familiar, Booming Blade, and Create Bonfire. And that's not super impactful. There's a lot of ways to get those. By the way, if it wasn't already obvious, what we're doing here is white room optimization. This means that we are maximising our damage to the detriment of everything else under very specific conditions. In a real game, you almost certainly wouldn't get the same results. Now that we had all the rules agreed, we had to get a build. The best place to start with something like this is generally the most obvious option. And for us, that was a 20th level Zealot Barbarian, who I'm going to call Zoe the Zealot. At 20th level, Barbarians get to have 24 strength, and they also get unlimited rages. Under our rules, that meant that Rage was no longer a resource, so it was allowed. This meant that Zoe gets an automatic plus 4 on every attack. The Zealot also gets the incredibly powerful Divine Fury, and that means that at 20th level, Zoe gets to add 1d6 plus 10 to the first hit on every turn. Some other important features from Barbarian are Reckless Strike and Brutal Critical 3. Now, as for the actual build, this took a bit of messing around, and we went through several iterations. However, the best we managed to do was a level 20 Zealot Barbarian Half-Orc using a Glaive. So we'll start with 17 strength, and for their air size they will take plus 2 strength, Crusher, which gives them another plus 1 strength, Great Weapon Master, Polearm Master, and Fighting Style, Great Weapon Fighting. This results in Zoe having a plus 8 to hit, with advantage thanks to Reckless Attack, and they do 1d10 plus 21 damage, or 1d4 plus 21 if they're using their Polearm Master bonus action attack. Also, on the first hit of their turn, Zoe gets to add an extra 1d6 plus 10, 
and when they crit, they don't just roll two die, they roll six die. Additionally, thanks to the rules of this challenge, the enemy will always try and approach Zoe. So if they step away from the enemy, they can guarantee the additional opportunity attack. So we won't have advantage on this attack unless they got a critical hit on their PAM bonus action attack, because that triggers the secondary effect of Crusher. So what does this come out to overall? Our first build sets the bar at the absolutely huge 90.70 average damage per round. After this first build, we had sort of worked out what did and didn't help, and importantly, what the big chase features were. Obviously, these builds had to be weapon builds. With no spell slots, you can't just cast Meteor Swarm and call it a day. That meant that you absolutely needed extra attack and a reaction attack, and attack roll boost and advantage were also incredibly important. It's pretty obvious how you get extra attack, so I won't go into that, but the rest are a bit harder to find. For reaction attacks, the only really viable options were Polar Master and a 3 level dip in Hunter Ranger for Giant Killer. This feature gives you a reaction attack whenever a large or larger creature attacks you within 5 feet, and thanks to our rules, that's guaranteed. I think it's worth pointing out that these rules were set before we found that interaction. As for attack roll bonuses, there were essentially just four options which were accessible at low cost. Fighting style archery, the Forge Cleric's Blessing of the Forge, and the Bladelock's Improved Packed Weapon. All of these were golden pickups, especially archery and Blessing of the Forge. Advantage was the real killer though. The only reliable options for that were a two level dip in Barbarian for Reckless Attack, or a three level dip in Rogue for Steady Aim. There's some other janky rules abuse that you can do, but I'm not going to explain them all here because they're kind of weird. This led to a highly interesting metagame where you were focused on getting as many of these high priority features as possible. The best classes and subclasses were completely different from normal D&D. I actually think the Hunter 3 was the single most common dip in this entire challenge. On to the next build. So the central idea for this one was that a Hexblade with the Life Drinker invocation can add double their charisma to their damage rolls. We'll call them Harry the Hexblade. This requires a 12 level investment into Warlock, so that's the starting point. We also decided that a Crossbow Expert build was probably the best option, as with a 3 level dip in Hunter, Harry can get both Giant Killer and Fighting Style Archery. This gave us a problem however. Hand Crossbow is not an option for Pact of the Blade, or Improved Pact Weapon. The only way to get a hand crossbow as your packed weapon is to perform the one hour ritual with a magic hand crossbow, and the only way to get one of those was with a two level dip in Artificer for the repeating shot. No other feature in the game explicitly gives you a magic weapon, so for now we have Hexblade 12, Hunter 3, Artificer 2, and just three levels left. Let's look at our chase features. We have extra attack from Thirsting Blade, plus three to our attack rolls from Archery and Repeating Shot, and a reaction attack from Giant Killer. Harry is missing advantage. Also, because Harry uses Charisma as their attacking stat, and we haven't picked race yet, Harry could get Elven Accuracy to give them super advantage. The obvious pick is of course Rogue 3 for steady aim, except now we have another problem. For this build to work, Harry needs 4 ASIs so they can take plus 2 Charisma, Elven Accuracy for another plus 1, Crossbow Expert, and Sharpshooter. Unfortunately, with Warlock 12, Ranger 3, Artificer 2, Rogue 3, they only have three ASIs, and we can't choose custom lineage for the fourth one, because then Harry won't qualify for Elven Accuracy. We needed to dedicate at least one more level to Ranger to get that fourth ASI. Unfortunately, this meant that we had to break out the jank, and use a technique called Familiar Stacking. This is an infinite loop, based on what was probably an accidental omission from the Replicate Magic Item Artificer Infusion. One of the options that it gives you is Common Magic Item Not Including Potions and Scrolls. What this doesn't prevent you from taking is the Spell Rot Tattoo, which can give you a single casting of a cantrip or a first level spell, including Find Familiar. So what you can do is you can give yourself a familiar. Easy. Then on the next day, you use your Spell Rot Tattoo on your familiar, and now your familiar has a familiar. Then the next day you use it on that familiar, and now your familiar's familiar has a familiar. This can be repeated infinitely, and it means that you can have all of your familiars simply prepare the help action to give you permanent advantage. I think it's worth pointing out that I banned this at my table. I do allow the spell or tattoo because I think it's actually fine and can produce some very interesting builds and solutions, but I say one familiar only. Who cares though, this isn't my table, it's silly white room optimization, and everything is legal. So Harry's final build is Hexblade Blade Packed Warlock 12, Giant Slayer Hunter Ranger 4, Artificer 2, and Rogue 1 for sneak attack. 
That leaves one more level, but I don't think there's actually anything useful that you could do with it. Harry already has a plus one weapon, so Forge isn't useful. They already have a bonus action, so Monk isn't useful. And there's no other offensive fighting styles. We also can't get another feat or useful feature from further investment. One slight optimization that we can do is Harry can learn Create Bonfire as a Warlock. This is a one minute concentration cantrip which does 48 damage on a deck save if the monster enters or ends its turn there, and thanks to the rules we can guarantee this. I'm going to be doing two damage calculations though, one with Bonfire and one without, because it's probably a bit cheap. Without Create Bonfire, Harry is doing 95.37 average damage per round. That's just over Zoe's 90.70. Create Bonfire is an additional 10.80 damage though, giving a grand total of 106.17. That's pretty damn good, but I think we can do better. By the way, all of the damage calculations for these builds will be in the description. I will warn you that they're done in my custom any dice library though, so they aren't the most reader friendly things in the world. Before we look at the next build, I think we should look at races. The only really viable options were Custom Lineage for the free feed, Half-Orc for Savage Attacks, any of the Elves for Elven Accuracy, and the Halfling for Lucky. All of the other races either use resources or whatever they have can be replicated by one of those four. By the way, we were banning the Volos Kobold and all of the other races which were reprinted in Mordenkainen's. We'd also done quite a few builds by this point. There were considerably more than what I'm presenting in this video, so we'd found a fair few things that were simply not worth going for. Any cleric other than exactly Forge 1, and any druid, sorcerer, bard, or monk past the first level dip for martial arts were simply not worth it. It's probably worth pointing out that actually the monk has less resourceless features than most full casters. On to more relevant things though, any ranger other than the hunter was just immediately a no, simply due to the opportunity cost of not getting giant killer. The only possible other option was a beastmaster, but we found it really hard to justify. Also, we had completely written off the rogue, outside of a three level dip for steady aim or a one level dip just because you didn't have anything better to do than add 1d6 sneak attack. Unfortunately, sneak attack just scales way too slowly for this challenge. Something that really surprised us though was how good the three level champion dip was. It gave you a fighting style, doubled your crit range, and put you just one level away from an additional feat. Another really big hitter was Bladesinger 6. This lets you add in Booing Blade once per turn for an additional 3d8 or 7d8 if you can make the enemy move, which isn't especially hard. The next build will make good use out of that. Finally, for this little interlude, I want to discuss one feat in particular, Ritual Caster. Ritual Caster is a weird feat because it's supposed to get more powerful the longer you have it, because you can write more rituals in it. Pretty much purely for the sake of fun, we decided that if you have Ritual Caster, you can put one additional ritual of every spell level in it. There aren't many relevant rituals, only really Phantom Steed, and maybe there's some weird stuff you can do with Magic Mouth or possibly Wrist Pocket. Those are some really janky spells if you take an incredibly literal reading of them. So this next build started out as a paladin throwing spears while using dueling and thrown weapon fighting. As interesting as it was, it ultimately failed because we couldn't find a good way to get advantage on the build. The paladin chassis was really good though, so we scrapped the throwing and came up with this. The reason the Paladin is so good here is because of Improved Defined Smite at 11 and the Oathbreaker's Aura of Hate. With these two features, you can add an extra 1d8 plus Charisma to every single attack. Normally, you then want to dip Hexblade for Charisma weapons, but we actually found that that made getting advantage a lot harder, and advantage was more important. Instead, we went with two levels of Barbarian for Reckless Attack and six levels of Bladesinger for Booming Blade Extra Attack. This build will be called Ollie the Oathbreaker. It's worth noting that Ollie is not using Rage or Blade Singing. Both of those features use resources, so are banned. That also means that they don't have to follow the no spells or no two-handed weapons limitations on those features though. The final level split for Ollie was Oathbreaker 12, Blade Singer 6, Barbarian 2. This gave them four feats to work with, as well as a completely open race, but meant that they were also somewhat mad, needing both strength and charisma, as well as at least some intelligence. Also, because Ollie is adding so much to their attacks, using Great Weapon Master actually decreases their DPR, even though they have advantage. The best build we found for Ollie was a custom lineage starting with 17 strength, 15 intelligence, 15 charisma, and 8 in the rest. They would then take Polar Master as their free custom lineage feat, and then pick up plus 2 strength, plus 2 charisma, and plus 1 in each, to end up on 20 strength, 18 charisma. 
That leaves one feat remaining, and the best we could find was a Warcaster. This allowed Ollie to turn their Polar Master Opportunity attack into a booming blade, adding 3d8 to the damage. If any of you have ever seen a video by Treant Monk about a build called the Force Lance, this is the same concept, just using a different cantrip. Unfortunately, doing this meant that Ollie couldn't use a glaive, because it has a reach of 10 feet and Booming Blade only has a range of self 5 foot radius, so instead Ollie has to use the slightly weaker spear. To support this, we added dueling from the Paladin, and Wizard gets Find Familiar to give the opportunity attack advantage even though Reckless Attack has ended, as well as create bonfire because Ollie isn't going to be using their concentration. Unfortunately, the DC for this is intelligence based though, so it's not as good as it was on Harry. Also, even though the enemy is now moving around, because it's huge, Ollie can just run to the other side of it to make sure it always starts and ends its turn in the bonfire. The final addition is Find Steed. This gives Ollie a Warhorse, which can be used kind of like an ordinary Tasha's Summon, just for a bit of extra damage. With the right positioning, it should get both a regular attack and an opportunity attack every turn. And by moving in a sort of a cross pattern, it should be able to use its trample feature every turn, without provoking any opportunity attacks. You could also just ride this Warhorse, which is honestly far more sensible in a real game, but this isn't a real game so we're doing silly stuff. So let's check out Ollie's damage. They're using a Spear with Dueling and Polearm Master, they get to use Booming Blade on one of their attacks each turn, and can trigger the secondary damage guaranteed. They can also make another Booming Blade as an opportunity attack each turn, although the secondary damage for this one won't trigger. Every single attack also adds 1d8 plus 4 damage, and they're getting the extra damage from Warhorse and Create Bonfire. On their own, Ollie does 106.45 damage. The Warhorse adds another 10.86 for 117.31, and Create Bonfire adds 8.10 DPR. In total, that's 125.41 DPR. We've broken through the 120 damage threshold. Ollie's doing almost double the damage of a crossbow expert sharpshooter fighter with permanent advantage. They're over 35 DPR higher than Zoe the Zealot, but I have one more build to show you. Before that though, I want to have one last interlude and look back over these builds. Each of these took hours of work, and there were a lot more which didn't end up going anywhere. I've already mentioned the Throne Weapon Paladin, but there was also a crazy 5 class Paladin Barbarian Ranger Warlock Cleric, a lot of work around the potentials of true Polymorph, and even some 2 weapon fighting builds. From all of this experience, a few things ended up sticking out to us. First, Giant Killer is ridiculously good. This challenge completely rewrote my opinion on the Hunter Ranger. Even outside this weird world where you can guarantee triggering Giant Killer every turn, I've seen so many situations where it would be fantastic. Second, the champion is an incredibly good dip. This doesn't port over to a normal game, but in this challenge, getting a fighting style, doubling your crit range, and being one level away from a feat is really good. Third, Create Bonfire is just 48 per round on a save or suck. That's really hard to pass up. And fourth, Booming Blade is actually incredible. On Ollie, the two Booming Blade attacks alone were 73.91 damage. That's almost 60% of everything they had going on. In fact, if you're a dex-based character, a single Booming Blade Repair attack with a guaranteed secondary is only 2.78 damage behind a crossbow expert sharpshooter archery fighting style build making three attacks, or 6.45 behind if the characters have advantage. What if there was a way to get even better attacks, or even to trigger Booming Blade's secondary damage twice in one round? Earlier I said that we discarded the Rogue because Sneak Attack regressed too slowly. That was our mistake. The final build we made, our ultimate build, was a rogue. This is India the Inquisitive. So India is by far the most powerful build we could come up with, but is also the most complicated, so I'm going to be taking this a step at a time. First up, India is using the same technique of using Booming Blade on a Polar Master Opportunity Attack with Warcaster, but as a rogue they need to be using a finesse weapon to get Sneak Attack, so there's a little bit of a twist. India has a Rapier and a Quarterstaff. They aren't using them for two weapon fighting, so they don't need the dual wielder feat. In fact, India is never intending to attack with the Quarterstaff, it's just there to trigger a Polearm Master Opportunity Attack. When that Opportunity Attack triggers, India will use Warcaster to cast Booming Blade, using the Rapier as the material component, and therefore attacking with the Rapier. This lets them use Booming Blade twice per round, and also use Sneak Attack twice per round. On the subject of Sneak Attack, I should probably explain why India is an Inquisitive Rogue. The Inquisitive is generally not a very good subclass. Its main feature is Insightful Fighting, which is a bonus action which allows you to make a contested skill check, and if you win, you can use Sneak Attack against the target even if you normally wouldn't be able to. 
that's pretty underpowered until you get to 17th level. Eye of Weakness is a 17th level feature which says that your sneak attack gets plus 3d6 against the target of insightful fighting. India is a 17th level inquisitive, so their sneak attack is functionally 12d6, and that's twice per round thanks to the Polar Master Warcaster combo. Now, India really needs advantage, and as a rogue, they can get that pretty easily with steady aim, but that only works on their own turn, and means that they can't move, so they don't get the 48 secondary damage from Booming Blade. Fortunately, both of those problems can be fixed with a single feat, Ritual Caster. I explained earlier that our rule set said that Ritual Caster lets you have a spell of every level, so India will pick up Find Familiar and Phantom Steed. The Familiar can give off-turn advantage, and the Phantom Steed can move for India, allowing them to use Steady Aim and still get Booming Blade secondary. Right, so earlier I teased triggering Booming Blade's 48 secondary damage twice in a round. That is actually possible with an uncontrolled mount. What you do is after India's turn, you have the mount move away, and then use the ready action to move away after India makes their reaction Booming Blade attack. Then, on the enemy's turn, they will move towards India, which will trigger the Booming Blade secondary damage, then India will use Pan Warcaster Booming Blade, then the mount will move away again, and the enemy will move a second time, triggering the second set of Booming Blade damage. Unfortunately, this requires Phantom Steed to use the ready action, so they can't use the disengage action. Phantom Steed ends with a single point of damage, and this felt a little bit too much like using a resource to us. So instead, I had to come up with the stupidest piece of horse-related tech you have ever seen outside of Skyrim. India is not going to be riding their horse. They're going to dismount, and then the horse is going to grapple them. If you want to argue that horses can't grapple because they don't have hands, fine, India will tie themselves to the horse instead. Now, India will be positioned on the corner of the enemy, and the horse will be grappling on the other side, so that it's always out of range, 10 feet away. It will then drag India away on its turn, and also ready a move to drag India away again on the enemy's turn. In this particular case, it's technically optimal for India to get dragged behind the horse rather than to ride it. In fact, if you're really smart about it and have the horse drag India in this sort of sideways G shape, you can actually make the enemy leave and then re-enter certain squares, so you can double trigger create bonfire if you know it. I think it's pretty obvious that you should basically never do this in a real game, but it's so incredibly dumb that I just had to mention it. Back to the world of normal sane people, as a dex-based character, India also really benefits from elven accuracy, so they should probably be an elf, and they then need another plus two dexterity to max out to 20. That means that India needs to have Booming Blade, Polearm Master, Warcaster, Ritual Caster, Elven Accuracy, and plus two dexterity. And by picking the High Elf race, we can get all of this thanks to Rogue's extra ASI at 10th level. The last thing to do with India is work out what their last three levels should be. They have advantage and a reaction attack, and they don't need extra attack or a bonus action. I will quickly mention that we did test this build with Arcane Tricks to 13, Blade Singer 6, Genie 1, and it actually did less damage. Getting Create Bonfire would be really good, especially with the prospect of a double trigger, and there's also the option of picking up a plus one weapon or some other damage increaser. Ultimately, there were four viable options which could be mixed and matched. Going up to Inquisitive Rogue 19 would give India another sneak attack die, and another ASI or feat. Forge Cleric 1 would give India a plus one weapon. Genie Warlock 1 would give India plus six on their main turn attack, as well as create bonfire. And finally, Champion Fighter 3 would allow India to crit on a 19, doubling their 48 plus 12d6 attacks to 8d8 plus 24d6 almost twice as often. Which of these options do you think will be best? I've tried calculating them all with as many different combinations that I could think of, and it's actually really close. There's less than 4 DPR between the best four options. If you're avoiding Create Bonfire, you should basically always go with Inquisitive 17, Champion 3. Doubling your crit range is honestly incredible when you're rolling 16 dice per attack. Second place is Inquisitive 19, Genie 1, taking Elemental Adept Thunder for the extra feat. With 14 d8 of thunder damage each turn, that 1 becomes 2 effect really stacks up. But first place, winning by just 0.06 DPR, is Inquisitive 19 Genie 1 with plus 2 charisma for the extra feat. That gives India a DC 18 create bonfire, which has a double trigger and is just barely more damage. So let's break down India's entire finalised build. There are High Elf Inquisitive Rogue 19 Genie Warlock 1. They start with 17 Dexterity, 16 Charisma, and 13 Wisdom. They have 6 ASIs and pick up plus 2 Dexterity, plus 2 Charisma, Elven Accuracy, increasing Dexterity to 20, 
Polearm Master, Warcaster, and Ritual Caster. India knows the spells Booming Blade, Create Bonfire, Find Familiar, and Phantom Steed. They hold a rapier and a quarterstaff, and get dragged around by their Phantom Steed. As set up, they cast Create Bonfire under the enemy, and then use Insightful Fighting on it. Then on their damaging turns, they use Steady Aim to get advantage, use Booming Blade with a rapier, get dragged by the horse onto the other side of the enemy so that it will move towards India and leave the bonfire, and then have the familiar use the help action on the enemy. On the enemy's turn, it moves towards India, triggering Booming Blade's 48 secondary, as well as Polar Master on the quarterstaff, allowing them to use Warcaster's Booming Blade with the rapier and getting a second sneak attack. The Phantom Steed drags India the other way, and the enemy walks back over, triggering Booming Blade's secondary damage again, and entering the bonfire, taking 48 damage. The enemy then ends its turn in the bonfire and takes the 48 again. Before telling you how much damage this all does, I want to go back over some of the other builds. Zoe the Zealot did 90.70 damage per round. Harry the Hexblade raised that bar to an average of 106.17. Ollie the Oathbreaker then brought it up to 125.41 DPR. But the ultimate build, Indy the Inquisitive, does a grand total of 205.46 damage per round. No resources, no one turn novas, no broken magic items. 205.46 damage every single round, repeatable forever. I hope it's clear how much fun I had doing all of this. I learned so much from it, but honestly the main takeaway was not to write something off without trying it. We basically just decided that the rogue wasn't worth it, but then it turned out to be by far the best thing out there. Always remember though, that when you see someone presenting a super powerful Nova build, there's a build which does over 200 damage every single round consistently. Honestly, most of these builds aren't really viable in a real game. They're far too single-mindedly focused on damage, and are simply too fragile. They're also very reliant on the dumb, predictable AI of the enemy, but with some slight adjustments, they'd be perfectly functional. India, for example, could be very solidly built as an arcane trickster or a swashbuckler. If you enjoyed this, make sure you subscribe for more, and I'd really appreciate it if you tell a friend about me. Have a go at this yourself. 200 DPR is a challenge even on most Nova builds. If you want to remove the jank from India of horse dragging for double booming blades and ban create bonfire, then your target is Inquisitive 17, Champion 3, doing 171.05 damage per round. See if you can beat that. Bye!